Way back in 2015, we picked our favorite movie monsters. It was a fun way to celebrate Halloween in the cinema, but if we could wind back the clock, we'd do it a little different. So we're gonna. These are our updated picks for the 10 best movie monsters of all time. Back when we first made this list, we sorted our movie monsters into some pretty straightforward categories. Mutants, aliens, the undead, it was very predictable. And almost nobody accused us of pretension for it, and we just can't abide by that. So we're redoing our list based on more artsy-fartsy criteria, cleaving the monster genre along emotional criteria, based on how the monsters are designed to make us feel. And up first is unsurprisingly, fear. But not just all fear all at once, we've got to stretch this conceit over 10 categories. So no, in this case, the most practical of monster fears, a fear of death. An emotional reaction evolved to jolt us into action and move us quickly away from harm. Death in the form of murderous boogeymen in Halloween and Friday the 13th, in the form of terrifying blind alien bioraptors in Pitch Black, and genetically cloned highly intelligent pack raptors in Jurassic Park. Death as an otherworldly jowled demon in Jeepers Creepers, as a zombie redneck torture family in Cabin in the Woods, as a pale awakened cannibal man with eyes in his hands in Pan's Labyrinth, death unstoppable in the body of the ring Samara, and hidden in the depths below us in movies like Underwater, Lake Placid, and Deep Rising. However, it is the xenomorph from Alien, the very sight of which has us barring every door and holding our flamethrowers very, very close, that takes our first spot. When Ridley Scott was handed Swiss artist H.R. Giger's Necronomicon, and he saw his unforgettable Necronom 4, there was no turning back from the surrealist's biomechanical vision for a beautifully deadly future. Once hired, Giger went on to employ his considerably twisted imagination to expand his drawing into a full-figured sculpture, designing it with carefully considered attention to those aesthetic features that were most horrifying. As close to human as possible, except not quite. Far too tall and far too skinny, without visible eyes so you could never tell when it was looking at you. Its jaws had a set of jaws, and it was to be fabricated with real bones and an actual human skull. Every detail was meticulously crafted to create the appearance of a perfectly evolved killing machine. And more than four decades later, this fact remains true. There is nothing that looks quite so lethal as the Xenomorph. But it's not just deadly looking, it's also beautiful. And it's not just a creature of violence, it's also sexual. It is the product of forced impregnation, which gave it just a whole extra layer of terror. That is, of course, to say that there is more to fear than just an aversion to dying, just as there's more to what the xenomorph evokes in us. There are things more complex and insidious that can make death seem preferable in comparison. So for our number nine slot, we're looking at terror pointed not at our own demise, but at that which is potentially worse. The fear of inescapable obsession evoked by the monster car Christine. The fear of wrongdoings returning with grave consequences embodied in the grudge. The fear of dark, closed spaces concealing unknown horrors in the descent. The fear of being turned to evil ourselves in From Dust Till Dawn and Dracula and every other vampire movie ever. The fear of the good we hold close becoming corrupted made manifest in Cujo. The fear of making a mistake or putting a foot wrong that the quiet place monsters hold humans to. The fear of our own subconscious that Freddy Krueger represents, and we're not quite sure what it is that makes clowns so terrifying, and we know it's a little more complicated than just death. We just hope it isn't the same extra reason as the xenomorph. <laughs> However, for our next pick, it is the fear that we ourselves are overwhelmed and taken over by evil that hits us closest to the heart, which is why we're going with Pazuzu from The Exorcist. Well then, let's introduce ourselves. I'm Damien Karras. And I'm that devil. Now kindly undo these straps. If you're the devil, why not make the straps disappear? That's much too vulgar a display of power, Karras. Where's Reagan? In here with us. Pazuzu is a monster that is never named and hardly even seen. In The Exorcist, he lies and calls himself Satan, and we catch only superimposed flash frames of the Mesopotamian demon. 
all we get are his words, his voice, and his effect on Linda Blair, but holy shit, is that enough? Over the course of the film, he subjects his young victim to such torment, distortion, and depravity that death seems a far lesser price, a fact that Father Karras would almost certainly agree with. The demon is perhaps cinema's clearest ever representation of pure evil, and he is far more frightening than just an extra effective serial killer. He is something that can force your loved ones to perform cruelty, and even potentially steal you away from yourself, and to us, that's a fate that's way more terrifying than death. <laughs> Next on our monster tour, we're looking at disgust. Those creatures designed to provoke immediate revulsion and offense to our better sensibilities. Said to be an emotional response to the behavioral immune system designed to keep humans away from potential causes of infection, disgust is triggered by all manners of contamination and corruption. Like the original Phantom of the Opera, concealing his true nature behind a mask. Or an alien ill fit within a human body from Men in Black. The mutants from The Hills Have Eyes. Or the disturbing infant thing from Eraserhead and the deplorable Skeksis, with personalities as reviling as their wretched bodies. However, our favorite, least favorite disgusting monsters are the grotesque, those that put the horror in body horror. And while we started our list with monsters that we were frightened to be in a room with, these are monsters we are frightened to become. Here you find Dren, a human-animal hybrid, the corrupted victims of parasitism from Slither, the disturbing mutants of Tokyo Gore Police, and particularly Tetsuo the Iron Man, who is the author of his own mutilation. And it's in that same vein that we arrive at our third pick, the utterly nightmarish Cenobites from the original Hellraiser. Pinhead, Butterball, the Chatterer, and the pathetically named female Cenobite are physical embodiments of perversion in its most literal sense. The good become bad and the bad become good. These Cenobites proudly wear their bodily disfigurements as hard-earned virtue, and seeing them for the very first time, our reaction is twofold. First, an immediate knee-jerk revulsion at a gut level, and second, the uncomfortable revelation, both horrifying and sickeningly fascinating, that the human body can be contorted in such a manner and keep working. And the scariest part is how human the Cenobites really are. They are not snarling, languageless creatures, or at least not all of them. Once upon a time, they were like us. The real horror of their backstory is that there was a road that led them from there to here, and they made the choice to keep walking the whole way. And the fact that we, the audience, can so easily suspend our disbelief about that says something very, very concerning about our own deep down human potential. It may seem strange to have torn through fear so quickly in a list of movie monsters, but trust us, we've got a long way to go yet. And for our next slot, we're stopping by fear's depressing cousin, Dread. It's like all the bad parts of fear, but without the fun burst of adrenaline that goes with it. These monsters create a sense of futility, of hopelessness, of doom that arrives slowly and without sharp-toothed fanfare. It's danger with no cure, a fear it's impossible to get away from. This is an unstoppable gelatin in the blob, a vengeance that transcends time and death from the original mummy. A ceaseless demonic infection from It Follows. Everything concealed in the all-consuming fog in the mist, and a host of aliens that cannot lose in Live, Die, Repeat. It's a fox devouring itself in Antichrist. A demonic goat from The Witch. A cold, uncaring robotic intelligence in 2001 A Space Odyssey. And an entire hotel in The Shining. Gamork from The NeverEnding Story is angst incarnate, but he's got nothing on the monster that takes any form and every form, the thing. We couldn't imagine a list of cinema's best monsters without Rob Bottin's any-faced atrocity. Made up of a hundred different kinds of Academy Award-winning creature effects, all practically made and performed, there is a hefty dose of the disgusting at play in the design of the nameless alien thing. But far more frightening than the mutilated excuse for heaps of human flesh that it morphs into is the deeper truth about the monster. It is anyone and everyone at all times. And while you're freaking out about how it might destroy you and your friends, you forget that it already has. It is unstoppable. The utter end of humanity. One cell of it enough to end our entire world. The monster represents an outcome so bleak and predetermined that it doesn't get a name. 
that the proper response in the face of it isn't fear, for fear would be too hopeful. No, the only real response is grim resolve at an apocalypse predetermined many thousands of years ago when the damn thing first arrived. Turning now toward the mysterious, we're looking at monsters designed now to primarily arouse our curiosity and wonder, that raise questions and demand investigation. Those monsters that make you lean in where most others make you want to run away, even as you suspect you shouldn't. Think the phenomenally designed aliens from Attack the Block, or the engineers of Prometheus, or the gargantuan Clover, or the aliens of the Vast of Night. More often than not, the key is that you hardly see these monsters, if at all. But in terms of monsters hardly put on screen, there's nothing with quite as much legend and lore as the giant man-eating shark from Jaws. Jaws is the ultimate parable of how good horror is like good burlesque, where the tease can be far more effective than the reveal. Although the affectionately nicknamed Bruce may have actually shown up on screen more if it weren't such a buggy animatronic beast. But we're glad he was, because instead of staring at his uncanny Shark Valley face for any more of the runtime than we have to, we catch him in glimpses and whiffs, and even worse, in story and rumor and exaggeration. He's allowed to live more in our mind than in our eyes, where he can be so much bigger and tailored exactly to our own particular nightmares. Our fifth pick in a row created primarily through practical rather than visual effects, Bruce's staying power is also our fifth but certainly not last testament to how crafting effective monsters has more to do with understanding how audiences' subconsciouses work than sharpening ever bigger sets of fangs. And in this case, it has everything to do with how much more powerful it can be to ask scary questions than it is to give scary answers. At number five, we're looking at monsters that don't quite make us lean in as much as they cause us to freeze in place, drop our jaw, and crane our neck upwards. These are monsters designed to evoke awe. Powerful beyond measure, trapping us between the fear of their destructive capacity and wonder at their immense grandeur. These are your classic kaiju, the modern Godzillas and beasts of Pacific Rim, the aliens of Arrival, Troll Hunters Troll. The Predator evokes awe not at his stature but with his abilities, and Legend's darkness commands awe with his very presence. The giant ants of Vim might seem silly now, but once upon a time they were a revolution in scale and made audiences of their day feel how the T-Rex of Jurassic Park makes most of us feel now. However, for our number 5 pick, we're handing the slot to a legendary monster awakened by those silly dwarves who couldn't help but delve too deep. That is, the Balrog from Lord of the Rings. What is this new devilry? Sending an army of vicious beasts greater in number than had ever previously been assembled on screen, scattering in terror, is a hell of a resume. But sending Gandalf running in fear is even worse. And the key thing here is that the Balrog is not on screen that much, yet it's entirely unforgettable. The Fellowship spends far longer running from its spectral glow than they do encountering it. We don't even see it really do any damage, fight or kill anything, it mostly just roars. Yet its aura as the biggest, baddest mother out there practically soaks through the screen. Its danger transcends the need for example or explanation, and that is something truly scary. You shall not pass! At number four, we arrive at the furthest point from fear on our tour, humor. Sometimes monsters are just designed to make you giggle. A romantic zombie in warm bodies, sentient vegetables from Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, some goofy-ass gremlins, especially in the sequel, the openly brainy Martians from Mars Attacks, pathetic zombies played for laughs all the way from Shaun of the Dead to Dead Snow, and I don't know, are we laughing at Deadites? I think so. We adore the musical monster Audrey 2 from Little Shop of Horrors and the ridiculous killer rabbit of Kyra Banog from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. However, if it's absurdity you want, there's nothing quite like Mr. Stay Puft from Ghostbusters. No! It can't be! What is it? It can't be! What did you do, Ray? Oh, sh shit! It's the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. 
Designed as a combined evocation of the Pillsbury Doughboy and the Michelin Man, it is tough to think of a sillier final boss than Mr. Stay Puff's 100-story tall mascot made of marshmallow. Possessed by an evil Sumerian demigod and kitted out in a cute sailor hat and kerchief. But then again, Ghostbusters is no average movie. Conjured up by Dan Aykroyd's character stance in an attempt to embody their evil foe in the most harmless possible form, Mr. Stay Puff manages to embody goofiness while still appearing to be a genuine threat, a notoriously difficult task for even the best horror comedies, and the key to maintaining the tension of Ghostbusters' climax. But it works. It keeps you laughing even as you're still pretty sure it'd kill you real dead, which is why it's one of the best monsters ever conjured up or banished back into another dimension. More than just making us feel, there are some creatures whose primary design motivation is to make us think. So at number three, one good way to do that is with the metaphor monster. It's not so much about what they are and how they look, but what they evoke and represent. In They Live, the aliens are a pretty obvious metaphor for the upper class. In Ginger Snaps, lycanthropy is a metaphor for puberty. In The Babadook, the monster is a metaphor for grief. The Candyman stands in for a history of racism, and you'll never guess what monsters like the monster from Id and Mama stand in for. However, it is the atomic monster, representing the doom wrought upon humanity by dropping the atomic bomb that gets our number three slot. We're talking, of course, about Godzilla. Godzilla was, shockingly, not actually the first giant awakened atomic lizard monster. That title goes squarely to Ray Harryhausen's beast from 20,000 Fathoms, the Rhinosaurus. The concept and design of which Godzilla is almost certainly more than a little borrowed from. But where the beast from 20,000 Fathoms metaphor mostly stops at its first act awakening, Godzilla extends it into a grave and sobering portrait of atomic fallout through its arms race damning conclusion. If you've only ever seen the later incarnations of the King of the Monsters, the original 1954 Godzilla may come as something of a shock. The awakened nuclear beast is no hero or joke here. Made not even 10 years in the shadow of one of history's greatest tragedies, Godzilla presents a tale too difficult to grapple with literally, cast instead in the form of a beast, giving it a face slightly more easy to look at than the truth. Closing in at number two, one of our absolute favorite kinds of monsters to encounter in a film is the kind built around triggering the audience's sympathy. The ultimate casting against type, sympathetic monsters frequently ask us to confront our initial, basal, emotional reactions to the appearance of things in order to find humanity in places we least expect it. This happens with Cooper from Super 8, the vampiric Eli from Let the Right One In, Guamul from The Host, and the monster from A Monster Calls. The asset from The Shape of Water takes empathy to the next level into romance. Built to evoke one of the classic sympathetic universal monsters, the Gill Man, not to mention its brother, the iconic Frankenstein's monster. The OG empathetic monster will always, of course, be the insane 1930s achievement that is King Kong. But for our number two pick, we have to give it up to David Cronenberg's absolutely unforgettable Brundlefly. I'm diseased and uh, it might be contagious somehow. I wouldn't want to infect you. And it's been accelerating. It's unrelenting every day there. It changes. Every time I look in the mirror, it's someone different, someone hideous, repulsive. What happened? I know an old lady who swallowed a fly, perhaps she'll die. The Fly traffics in a different flavor of sympathy from all of our other runner-ups, delivered alongside a massive dose of disgust, of the grotesque body horror sort, to a distinctly pathetic result. You feel for Goldblum, but you aren't quite rooting for him. You experience his suffering alongside him, the disturbing loss of body and mind, but not in a way that cancels out our previous assumptions. In fact, Goldblum's sympathy arc is the exact opposite of most other twist sympathetic monsters. You start out completely on his team until the horror of the story pushes you further and further away from it. But you try so hard to cling to his humanity nonetheless, exactly like he does. Even as there's hardly any left, you want to be on his side, but the film makes it less and less possible. And that is how the film uses your empathy and Goldblum's irresistible charisma against you. Because by the end, you're not rooting for a good guy trapped in a hideous body, you're rooting for a real goddamn monster. 
Finally, closing in at number one, we're looking at those monsters who first steal your empathy and then take it a step further to flip the script on the humans they're accused of terrorizing, that serve as a mirror and foil to humanity to reveal that it is really us who are the monsters all along. E.T. shows us how we are more our own threat than the outside world we're trying to protect ourselves from. District 9 takes us from one side of a divide to the other with a literal transformation. The village blurs the line between humans and monsters in the name of compliance. The Others pulls a Kansas City ghost shuffle while Colossal takes this category very literally. Both The Day the Earth Stood Still and Planet of the Apes are amazing classic iterations of this trope, but for our number one pick, we have to hand it to the titular beast from the original 1946 Beauty and the Beast. More fairy tale than traditional horror film, La Belle et la Beta was still a landmark in gothic mood, and especially monster design. With makeup effects, you can almost reach out and feel the beast's appearance seems to simultaneously draw you in and push you away. The broad strokes of the story remain those we all know, and the beast, despite his name, is hardly a beast at all. But while the story is one most American viewers are surely familiar with today, the mood and execution are worlds apart from the Disney remake. There is a real magic in it, a real struggle with one's own nature and a real kindness in Belle's ability to look beyond the beast's outsides. And even as you see it coming from seven decades away, the moral conceit of who the real beast is still makes an unmistakable impact, which is why we think he's one of the best movie monsters of all time. So what do you think? Disagree with any of our picks? Do we leave out any of your favorite monsters? Which of these terrors do you think would win an all-out battle royale? Let us know in the comments below with as much gory detail as you can handle. And be sure to subscribe to IGN Movies and TV for more Cinefix movie lists.